Section 52 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1, by Robert Burton. Section 52. Partition 1. Section 3. Member 3. Immediate cause of these precedent symptoms. To give some satisfaction to melancholy men that are troubled with these symptoms, a better means, in my judgment, cannot be taken than to show them the causes whence they proceed, not from devils, as they suppose, or that they are bewitched or forsaken of God, hear or see, etc., as many of them think, but from natural and inward causes, that, so knowing them, they may better avoid the effects, or at least endure them with more patience. The most grievous and common symptoms are fear and sorrow, and that without a cause to the wisest and discreetest men, in this malady not to be avoided. The reason why they are so, Aetius discusseth at large, Tetra Biblos too, Two, in his first problem out of Galen, Book Two, De Causis Symptomatum One, for Galen imputeth all to the cold that is black, and thinks that the spirits being darkened and the substance of the brain cloudy and dark, all the objects thereof appear terrible, and the mind itself by those dark, obscure, gross fumes ascending from black humours is in continual darkness, fear and sorrow, diverse, terrible, monstrous fictions in a thousand shapes and apparitions occur with violent passions, by which the brain and fantasy are troubled and eclipsed. Fracastorius, Book Two, De Intellectione, will have cold to be the cause of fear and sorrow, for such as are cold are ill-disposed to mirth, dull, heavy, by nature solitary, silent, and not for any inward darkness, as physicians think, for many melancholy men dare boldly be, continue, and walk in the dark, and delight in it. Solum frigidi, timidi, if they be hot, they are merry, and the more hot, the more furious, and void of fear, as we see in madmen, but this reason holds not, for then no melancholy, proceeding from collar adust, should fear. Averroes scoffs at Galen for his reasons, and brings five arguments to repel them. So doth Hercules de Saxonia, Tractatus de Melancholia, Perfectissimus, chapter 3, assigning other causes, which are copiously censured and confuted by Aelianus Montaltus, Chapter 5 and 6, Lodovicus Mercatus, Altomarus, Guanerius, Bright, Laurentius, Valesius. This temperature, they conclude, makes black juice. Blackness obscures the spirits. The spirits obscured cause fear and sorrow. Laurentius, chapter 13, supposeth these black fumes offend specially the diaphragma or midriff, and so per consequens the mind, which is obscured as the sun by a cloud. To this opinion of Galen almost all the Greeks and Arabians subscribe, the Latins new and old, internae tenebrae offuscant animum, ut externae nocent pueris, as children are affrighted in the dark, so are melancholy men at all times, as having the inward cause with them, and still carrying it about. Which black vapours, whether they proceed from the black blood about the heart, as Thomas Wright Jesuit thinks in his treatise of the passions of the mind, or stomach, spleen, midriff, or all the misaffected parts together, it boots not. They keep the mind in a perpetual dungeon, and oppress it with continual fears, anxieties, sorrows, etc. It is an ordinary thing for such as are sound to laugh at this dejected pusillanimity, and those other symptoms of melancholy, 
to make themselves merry with them, and to wonder at such as toys and trifles, which may be resisted and withstood if they will themselves. But let him that so wonders consider with himself that if a man should tell him on a sudden some of his especial friends were dead, could he choose but grieve, or set him upon a steep rock, where he should be in danger to be precipitated, could he be secure, his heart would tremble with fear, and his head be giddy. P. Bayaras gives instance, as I have said, and put case, saith he, in one that walks upon a plank, if it lie upon the ground, he can safely do it, but if the same plank be laid over some deep water, instead of a bridge, he is vehemently moved, and tis nothing but his imagination, forma cadendi impressa, to which his other members and faculties obey. Yea, but you infer that such men have a just cause to fear, a true object of fear. So have melancholy men an inward cause, a perpetual fume and darkness, causing fear, grief, suspicion, which they carry with them, an object which cannot be removed, but sticks as close and is as inseparable as a shadow to a body, and who can expel or overrun his shadow? Remove heat of the liver, a cold stomach, weak spleen, remove those adust humours and vapours arising from them, black blood from the heart, all outward perturbations, take away the cause, and then bid them not grieve nor fear, or be heavy, dull, lumpish, otherwise counsel can do little good, you may as well bid him that is sick of an ague not to be a dry, or him that is wounded not to feel pain. Suspicion follows fear and sorrow at heels, arising out of the same fountain, so thinks Fracastorius, that fear is the cause of suspicion, and still they suspect some treachery, or some secret machination to be framed against them, still they distrust. Restlessness proceeds from the same spring, variety of fumes make them like and dislike, solitariness, avoiding of light, they that are weary of their lives, hate the world, arise from the same causes, for their spirits and humours are opposite to light. Fear makes them avoid company, and absent themselves, lest they should be misused, hissed at, or overshoot themselves, which still they suspect. They are prone to venery by reason of wind, angry, waspish, and fretting still, out of abundance of choler, which causeth fearful dreams and violent perturbations to them, both sleeping and waking. They that suppose they have no heads, fly, sink, they are pots, glasses, etc., is wind in their heads. Hercules de Saxonia doth ascribe this to the several motions in the animal spirits, their dilation, contraction, confusion, alteration, tenebrosity, hot or cold distemperature, excluding all material humours. Fracastorius accounts it a thing worthy of inquisition, why they should entertain such false conceits, as they that have horns, great noses, that they are birds, beasts, etc., why they should think themselves kings, lords, cardinals. For the first, Fracastorius gives two reasons. One is the disposition of the body, the other the occasion of the fantasy, as if their eyes be purblind, their ears sing, by reason of some cold and rheum, etc. To the second, Laurentius answers, the imagination inwardly or outwardly moved, represents to the understanding, not enticements only, to favour the passion or dislike, but a very intensive pleasure follows the passion or displeasure, and the will and reason are captivated by delighting in it. Why students and lovers are so often melancholy and mad, the philosopher of Coimbra assigns this reason, because by a vehement and continual meditation of that wherewith they are affected, they fetch up the spirits into the brain, and with the heat brought with them, they incend it beyond measure, and the cells of the inner senses dissolve their temperature, which being dissolved, they cannot perform their offices as they ought.
Why melancholy men are witty, which Aristotle hath long since maintained in his problems, and that all learned men, famous philosophers and lawgivers, ad unum fere omnes melancholici, have still been melancholy, is a problem much controverted. Jason Pratensis will have it understood of natural melancholy, which opinion Melanchthon inclines to in his book De Anima, and Marcilius Ficinus, De Sanitate Tuenda, Book 1, Chapter 5, but not simple, for that makes men stupid, heavy, dull, being cold and dry, fearful fools, and solitary, but mixed with the other humours, phlegm only excepted, and they not adust, but so mixed as that blood be half, with little or no adustion, that they be neither too hot nor too cold. Aponensis, cited by Melanchthon, thinks it proceeds from melancholy adust, excluding all natural melancholy as too cold. Laurentius condemns his tenet, because a dustion of humours makes men mad, as lime burns when water is cast on it. It must be mixed with blood, and somewhat adust, and so that old aphorism of Aristotle may be verified, nullum magnum ingenium sine mixtura dementiae, no excellent wit without a mixture of madness. Fracastorius shall decide the controversy. Phlegmatic are dull, sanguine, lively, pleasant, acceptable, and merry, but not witty. Choleric are too swift in action, and furious, impatient of contemplation, deceitful wits. Melancholy men have the most excellent wits, but not all. This humour may be hot or cold, thick or thin. If too hot, they are furious and mad. If too cold, dull, stupid, timorous and sad. If temperate, excellent, rather inclining to that extreme of heat than cold. This sentence of his will agree with that of Heraclitus. A dry light makes a wise mind. Temperate heat and dryness are the chief causes of a good wit. Therefore, saith Aelian, an elephant is the wisest of all brute beasts, because his brain is driest, et ob atri bilis capiam. This reason Cardan approves. Johannes Baptista Silvaticus, a physician of Milan, in his first controversy, hath copiously handled this question. Rulandus in his problems, Caelius Rodiginus, Valeriola, Hercules de Saxonia, Lodovicus Mercatus, Baptista Porta, and many others. Weeping, sighing, laughing, itching, trembling, sweating, blushing, hearing and seeing strange noises, visions, wind, crudity, are motions of the body, depending upon these precedent motions of the mind. Neither are tears affections, but actions, as Scaliger holds. The voice of such as are afraid trembles, because the heart is shaken. Why they stutter or falter in their speech, Mercurialis and Montautus give like reasons out of Hippocrates, dryness, which makes the nerves of the tongue torpid. Fast speaking, which is a symptom of some, Aetius will have caused from abundance of wind and swiftness of imagination. Baldness comes from excess of dryness, hirsuteness from a dry temperature. The cause of much waking in a dry brain, continual meditation, discontent, fears and cares that suffer not the mind to be at rest, incontinency is from wind and a hot liver, Montanus. Rumbling in the guts is caused from wind, and wind from ill concoction, weakness of natural heat, or a distempered heat and cold, palpitation of the heart from vapours, heaviness, and aching from the same cause. That the belly is hard, wind is a cause, and of that leaping in many parts, redness of the face, and itching, as if they were flea-bitten, or stung with pismires, from a sharp, subtle wind. Cold sweat from vapours arising from the hypochondries, which pitch upon the skin. Leanness for want of good nourishment. Why their appetite is so great, Baetius answers, Os ventris frigescit, cold in those inner parts, cold belly, and hot liver, causeth crudity, 
and intention proceeds from perturbations. Our souls, for want of spirits, cannot attend exactly to so many intentive operations, being exhaust and overswayed by passion. She cannot consider the reasons which may dissuade her from such affections. Bashfulness and blushing is a passion proper to men alone, and is not only caused for some shame and ignominy, or that they are guilty unto themselves of some foul fact committed, but, as Fracastorius well determines, ob defectum proprium, et timorem, from fear and the conceit of our defects. The face labours and is troubled at his presence that sees our defects, and nature, willing to help, sends thither heat. Heat draws the subtlest blood, and so we blush. They that are bold, arrogant, and careless, seldom or never blush, but such as are fearful. Antonius Lodovicus, in his book De Pudore, will have this subtle blood to arise in the face, not so much for the reverence of our betters in presence, but for joy and pleasure, or if anything at unawares shall pass from us, a sudden accident, a curse, or meeting, which Desarius in Macrobius confirms, any object heard or seen, for blind men never blush. As Dandinus observes, the night and darkness make men impudent, or that we be stayed before our betters, or in company we like not, or if anything molest and offend us, erubescentia turns to rubor, blushing to a continuate redness. Sometimes the extremity of the ears tingle and are red, sometimes the whole face, et sin nihil vitiosum commiseris, as Lodovicus holds. Though Aristotle is of opinion, omnis pudor ex vitio commiso, all shame for some offence. But we find otherwise, it may as well proceed from fear, from force and inexperience. So Dandinus holds, as vice, a hot liver, saith Duretus, notis in holerium, from a hot brain, from wind, the lungs heated, or after drinking of wine, strong drink, perturbations, etc., Laughter, what it is, saith Tully, how caused, where, and so suddenly breaks out, that desirous to stay it, we cannot, how it comes to possess and stir our face, veins, eyes, countenance, mouth, sides, let Democritus determine. The cause that it often affects melancholy men so much is given by Gomesius, abundance of pleasant vapours, which in sanguine melancholy especially, break from the heart, and tickle the midriff, because it is transverse and full of nerves, by which titillation the sense being moved, and arteries distended or pulled, the spirits from thence move, and possess the sides, veins, countenance, eyes. See more in Josius de Risu et Flatu, Vives, Book 3, De Anima, Tears, as Scaliger defines, proceed from grief and pity, or from the heating of a moist brain, for a dry cannot weep. That they see and hear so many phantasms, chimeras, noises, visions, etc., as Fienus has discoursed at large in his book of imagination, and Lavater de Spectris, part 1, chapters 2, 3, 4, their corrupt fantasy makes them see and hear that which indeed is neither heard nor seen. Qui multum jejunant aut noctes ducunt insomnes. They that much fast or want sleep, as melancholy or sick men commonly do, see visions, or such as are weak-sighted, very timorous by nature, mad, distracted, or earnestly seek. Sabini quod volunt somniant, as the saying is, they dream of that they desire. Like Sarmiento the Spaniard, who, when he was sent to discover the Straits of Magellan and confined places, by the prorex of Peru, standing on the top of a hill, am I nisimam planitiem despicere sibi visus fuit, edificia magnifica, quam plurimus pagos, alias tures, splendida templa, and brave cities, built like ours in Europe, not, saith mine author, that there was any such thing, but that he was vanissimus et nimis credulus, and would fain have had it so. 
or, as Lodovicus Mercatus proves, by reason of inward vapours and humours from blood, choler, etc., diversely mixed, they apprehend and see outwardly, as they suppose, diverse images, which indeed are not. As they that drink wine think all runs round, when it is their own brain, so it is with these men, the fault and cause is inward, as Galen affirms. Madmen and such as are near death, quas extra se videre putant imagines, intra oculos habent, tis in their brains which seems to be before them. The brain as a concave glass reflects solid bodies. Senes etiam decrepiti, cerebrum habent concavum et aridum, ut imaginentur se videre, saith Boisardus, quae non sunt. Old men are too frequently mistaken, and dote in like cases, or as he that looketh through a piece of red glass, judgeth everything he sees to be red. Corrupt vapours, mounting from the body to the head, and distilling again from thence to the eyes, when they have mingled themselves with the watery crystals, which receiveth the shadows of things to be seen, make all things appear of the same colour, which remains in the humour that overspreads our sight. As to melancholy men all is black, to phlegmatic all white, etc. Or else as before the organs corrupt by a corrupt fantasy, as Lemnius, Book 1, Chapter 16, well quotes, cause a great agitation of spirits and humours which wander to and fro in all the creeks of the brain and cause such apparitions before their eyes. One thinks he reads something written in the moon, as Pythagoras is said to have done of old, another smells brimstone, hears Cerberus bark, Orestes now mad, supposed he saw the furies tormenting him, and his mother still ready to run upon him. O oh, mater obsecro noli me persequi, his furiis, aspectu anguineis, horribilibus, ecce, ecce me invadunt, in me iam ruunt. But Electra told him, thus raving in his mad fit, he saw no such sights at all, it was but his crazed imagination. Quiesce, quiesce miser in linteis tuis, Non cernis et enim quae videre te putas. So Pentheus, in Bacchis Euripidis, saw two sons, two Thebes, his brain alone was troubled. Sickness is an ordinary cause of such sights. Cardan, mens aegera laboribus et iaeuniis fracta, facit eos videre, audire, etc., and Osiander beheld strange visions, and Alexander, ab Alexandro, both in their sickness, which he relates, De Rerum Varietate, Book 8, Chapter 44. Albategnius, that noble Arabian, on his deathbed, saw a ship ascending and descending, which Fracastorius records of his friend Baptista Tyrianus. Weak sight and a vain persuasion withal may affect as much, and second causes concurring, as an oar in water makes a refraction, and seems bigger, bended double, etc. The thickness of the air may cause such effects, and any object not well discerned in the dark, fear and fantasy will suspect to be a ghost, a devil, etc. Quod nimis miseri timent, hoc facile credunt. We are apt to believe and mistake in such cases. Marcellus Donatus, Book 2, Chapter 1, brings in a story out of Aristotle, of one Antipharon, which likely saw, wheresoever he was, his own image in the air, as in a glass. Vitellio hath such another instance of a familiar acquaintance of his, that, after the want of three or four nights' sleep, as he was riding by a riverside, saw another riding with him, and using all such gestures as he did, but when more light appeared, it vanished. Eremites and anchorites have frequently such absurd visions, revelations by reason of much fasting and bad diet. Many are deceived by leisure de main, as Scott hath well showed in his book of the discovery of witchcraft, and carden, suffites, perfumes, 
suffumigations, mixed candles, perspective glasses, and such natural causes, make men look as if they were dead, or with horses' heads, bulls' horns, and such like brutish shapes, the room full of snakes, adders, dark, light, green, red, of all colours, as you may perceive in Baptista Porta, Alexis, Albertus, and others, glow-worms, fire-drakes, meteors, ignis fatuus, which Plinius, book 2, chapter 37, calls Castor and Pollux, with many such that appear in Moorish grounds, about churchyards, moist valleys, or where battles have been fought, the causes of which read in Goclenius, Veluris, Ficius, etc., such fears are often done to frighten children with squibs, rotten wood, etc., to make folks look as if they were dead. Solito maiores, bigger, lesser, fairer, fouler, ut astante sine capitibus videantur, aut toti igniti, aut forma daemonum, acipe pilos canis, nigri, etc., saith Albertus, and so tis ordinary to see strange uncouth sights by catoptrics, who knows not that if in a dark room the light be admitted at one only little hole, and a paper or glass put upon it, the sun shining will represent on the opposite wall all such objects as are illuminated by his rays. With concave and cylinder glasses we may reflect any shape of men, devils, antics, as magicians most part do, to gull a silly spectator in a dark room, we will ourselves, and that hanging in the air, when tis nothing but such an horrible image as Agrippa demonstrates, placed in another room. Roger Bacon of old is said to have represented his own image walking in the air by this art, though no such thing appear in his perspectives. But most part it is in the brain that deceives them, although I may not deny, but that oftentimes the devil deludes them, taking his opportunity to suggest and represent vain objects to melancholy men, and such as are ill affected. To these you may add the knavish impostures of jugglers, exorcists, mass priests, and mountebanks, of whom Roger Bacon speaks, etc., de miraculis naturae et artis, Chapter 1. They can counterfeit the voices of all birds and brute beasts almost, all tones and tunes of men, and speak within their throats, as if they spoke afar off, that they make their auditors believe they hear spirits, and are thence much astonished and affrighted with it. Besides, those artificial devices to overhear their confessions, like that whispering place of Gloucester with us, or like the Duke's place at Mantua in Italy, where the sound is reverberated by a concave wall, a reason of which Blancanus, in his Echometria, gives and mathematically demonstrates. So that the hearing is as frequently deluded as the sight, from the same causes almost, as he that hears bells will make them sound what he list. As the fool thinketh, so the bell clinketh, Theophilus in Galen thought he heard music from vapours which made his ears sound, etc. Some are deceived by echoes, some by roaring of waters, or concaves and reverberations of air in the ground, hollow places and walls. At Cadurcum, in Aquitaine, words and sentences are repeated by a strange echo to the full, or whatsoever you shall play upon a musical instrument, more distinctly and louder than they are spoken at first. Some echoes repeat a thing spoken seven times, as at Olympus in Macedonia, as Pliny relates, Book 36, Chapter 15. Some twelve times, as at Charenton, a village near Paris in France. At Delphos in Greece, heretofore, was a miraculous echo, and so in many other places. Cardan, hath wonderful stories of such as have been deluded by these echoes. Blancanus, the Jesuit, in his Echometria, hath variety of examples, and gives his reader full satisfaction of all such sounds by way of demonstration. At Barry, an isle in the Seven Mouth, they seem to hear a smith's forge. 
so at Lipari, and those sulphurious isles, and many such like, which Olaus speaks of in the continent of Scandia, and those northern countries. Cardan mentioneth a woman that still supposed she heard the devil call her, and speaking to her. She was a painter's wife in Milan, and many such illusions and voices, which proceed most part from a corrupt imagination. When it comes to pass that they prophesy, speak several languages, talk of astronomy, and other unknown sciences to them, of which they have been ever ignorant, I have in brief touched. Only this I will here add, that Arculanus Bodin, Liber Tres, Caput Sex, Daimonia, and some others, hold as a manifest token that such persons are possessed with the devil. So doth Hercules de Saxonia and Apponensis, and fit only to be cured by a priest. But Guanerius, Montaltus, Pomporiatius of Padua, and Lemnius, Book 2, Chapter 2, refer it wholly to the ill disposition of the humour, and that out of the authority of Aristotle, because such symptoms are cured by purging and as by the striking of a flint fire is enforced, so by the vehement motion of spirits, they do elicere voces inauditas, compel strange speeches to be spoken. Another argument he hath from Plato's reminiscentia, which is all out as likely as that which Marsilius Ficinus speaks of his friend Pier Leonus, by a divine kind of infusion, he understood the secrets of nature and tenets of Grecian and barbarian philosophers before ever he had heard of, saw, or read their works. But in this I should rather hold with Avicenna and his associates that such symptoms proceed from evil spirits, which take all opportunities of humours decayed, or otherwise to pervert the soul of man. And besides, the humour itself is balneum diaboli, the devil's bath, and as Agrippa proves, doth entice him to seize upon them. End of section 52「Section 53 of The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1 – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Anatomy of Melancholy, Volume 1, by Robert Burton – Section 53 – Partition 1, Section 4 – Prognostics of Melancholy Prognostics, or signs of things to come, are either good or bad. If this malady be not hereditary, and taken at the beginning, there is good hope of cure, recens curationem, non habet difficilem, saith Avicenna. That which is with laughter, of all others, is most secure, gentle and remiss. Hercules de Saxonia if that evacuation of haemorrhoids, or varices, which they call the water between the skin, shall happen to a melancholy man, his misery is ended. Hippocrates, Aphorisms, 6, 11, Galen, Book 6, De Morbis Vulgaribus, 8, confirms the same. And to this aphorism of Hippocrates, all the Arabians, new and old Latins, subscribe. Montaltus, Hercules de Saxonia, Mercuralis, Pitorius Faventinus, etc. Skenkius illustrates this aphorism with an example of one Daniel Federer, a coppersmith that was long melancholy, and in the end mad about the twenty-seventh year of his age. These varices or water began to arise in his thighs, and he was freed from his madness. Marius the Roman was so cured, some say, though with great pain. Skenkius hath some other instances of women that have been helped by flowing of their mouths, which before were stopped. That the opening of the haemorrhoids will do as much for men, all physicians jointly signify, so they be voluntary, some say, and not by compulsion. 
All melancholy are better after a quartern, Jobertus saith, scarce any man hath that ague twice, but whether it free him from his malady, tis a question, for many physicians ascribe all long agues for especial causes, and a quartern ague amongst the rest. Brassis, continens, liber unus, novem, when melancholy gets out at the superficies of the skin, or settles, breaking out in scabs, leprosy, morphew, or is purged by stools, or by the urine, or that the spleen is enlarged, and those varices appear, the disease is dissolved. Guanerius, chapter 5, Tractatus 15, adds dropsy, jaundice, dysentery, leprosy, as good signs, to these scabs, morphews, and breaking out, and proves it out of the sixth of Hippocrates' aphorisms. Evil prognostics, on the other part, inveterata melancholia incurabilis, if it be inveterate, it is incurable, a common axiom, out difficulter curabilis, as they say that make the best, hardly cured. This Galen witnesseth, Book 3, De Locis Affectis, Chapter 6, be it in whom it will, or from what cause soever, it is ever long, wayward, tedious, and hard to be cured, if once it be habituated. As Lucian said of the gout, she was the queen of diseases and inexorable, may we say of melancholy. Yet Paracelsus will have all diseases whatsoever curable, and laughs at them which think otherwise, as Tierastus objects to him although in another place hereditary diseases he accounts incurable and by no art to be removed hildesheim holds it less dangerous if only imagination be hurt and not reason the gentlest is from blood worse from choler adust but the worst of all from melancholy putrefied Bruel esteems hypochondriacal least dangerous and the other two species opposite to galen hardest to be cured. The cure is hard in man, but much more difficult in women. And both men and women must take notice of that saying of Montanus, Pro abate Italo. This malady doth commonly accompany them to their grave. Physicians may ease, and it may lie hid for a time, but they cannot quite cure it, but it will return again more violent and sharp than at first and that upon every small occasion or error, as in Mercury's weather-beaten statue that was once all over gilt, the open parts were clean, yet there was in fimbriis aurum, in the chinks a remnant of gold. There will be some relics of melancholy left in the purest bodies, if once tainted, not so easily to be rooted out. Oftentimes it degenerates into epilepsy, apoplexy, convulsions, and blindness, by the authority of Hippocrates and Galen, all of her, if once it possess the ventricles of the brain, Frambisarius and Sallust. Salvianus adds, if it gets into the optic nerves, blindness. Mercurialis had a woman to his patient that from melancholy became epileptic and blind. If it come from a cold cause, or so continue cold, or increase, epilepsy, convulsions follow, and blindness, or else in the end they are moped, sottish, and in all their actions, speeches, and gestures, ridiculous. If it come from a hot cause, they are more furious and boisterous, and in conclusion, mad. Carescentem melancholiam, saepius sequitur mania, if it heat and increase, that is the common event, per circuitus, aut semper insanit, he is mad by fits, or altogether. For, as Senertus contends, out of Crato, there is seminarius ignis in this humour, the very seeds of fire. If it come from melancholy, natural adust, and in excess, they are often demoniacal, montanus. Seldom this malady procures death, except, which is the greatest, most grievous calamity, and the misery of all miseries, they make away themselves, which is a frequent thing, and familiar amongst them. Tis Hippocrates' observation, 
gallens sentence, etsi mortem timent, tamen plerumque sibi ipsis mortem consciscunt. Book three, De Locis Affectis, chapter seven. The doom of all physicians. Tis Rabbi Moses's aphorism, the prognosticon of Avicenna, Rasis, Aetius, Gordonius, Valescus, Altomarus, Sallust, Salvianus, Capivacius, Mercatus, Hercules de Saxonia, Piso, Bruel, Fuxius, all, etc. Et saepe usque adio mortis formidine vitae, percipit in felix odium lucisque videndae, ut sibi consciscat my renti pectori lethum, and so far forth death's terror doth affright, he makes away himself, and hates the light. To make an end of fear and grief of heart, he voluntary dies to ease his smart. In such sort doth the torture and extremity of his misery torment him, that he can take no pleasure in his life, but is in a manner enforced to offer violence unto himself to be freed from his present insufferable pains. So some, saith Francastorius, in fury, but most in despair, sorrow, fear, and out of the anguish and vexation of their souls, offer violence to themselves, for their life is unhappy and miserable. They can take no rest in the night, nor sleep, or if they do slumber, fearful dreams astonish them. In the daytime they are affrighted still by some terrible object, and torn in pieces with suspicion, fear, sorrow, discontents, cares, shame, anguish, etc., as so many wild horses, that they cannot be quiet an hour, a minute of time, but even against their wills they are intent, and still thinking of it. They cannot forget it, it grinds their souls day and night. They are perpetually tormented, a burden to themselves, as Job was. They can neither eat, drink, or sleep. Psalm 107, 18 Their soul abhorreth all meat, and they are brought to death's door, being bound in misery and iron. They curse their stars with Job, and day of their birth, and wish for death. For as Pineda and most interpreters hold, Job was even melancholy to despair, and almost madness itself. They murmur many times against the world, friends, allies, all mankind, even against God himself in the bitterness of their passion. We were nolunt, mori nesciunt. Live they will not, die they cannot. And in the midst of these squalid, ugly, and such irksome days, they seek at last, finding no comfort, no remedy in this wretched life, to be eased of all by death. Omnia appetunt bonum, all creatures seek the best, and for their good, as they hope, sub specie, in show at least, well quia mori pulcrum putant, saith Hippocrates, well quia putant inde se maioribus malis liberare, to be freed as they wish. Though many times, as Aesop's fishes, they leap from the frying pan into the fire itself, yet they hope to be eased by this means. And therefore, saith Felix Platerus, after many tedious days at last, either by drowning, hanging, or some such fearful end, they precipitate or make away themselves. Many lamentable examples are daily seen amongst us, Alius ante fores se laquio suspendit, as Seneca notes. Alius se praecipitavit a tecto, ne dominum stomacentem audiret. Alius ne reduceretur a fuga, ferum redegit in viscera. One hangs himself before his own door. Another throws himself from the housetop to avoid his master's anger. A third to escape expulsion plunges a dagger into his heart. So many causes there are. His amor exitio est, furor his. Love, grief, anger, madness, and shame, etc. 
"'Tis a common calamity, a fatal end to this disease. "'They are condemned to a violent death by a jury of physicians, "'furiously disposed, carried headlong by their tyrannizing wills, "'enforced by miseries, and there remains no more to such persons, "'if that heavenly physician, by his assisting grace and mercy alone, "'do not prevent, for no human persuasion or art can help, but to be their own butchers, and execute themselves. Socrates his Kikuta, Lucretia's dagger, Timon's halter, are yet to be had. Cato's knife and Nero's sword are left behind them, as so many fatal engines, bequeathed to posterity, and will be used to the world's end, by such distressed souls, so intolerable, insufferable, Grievous and violent is their pain, so unspeakable and continuate. One day of grief is an hundred years, as Cardan observes. Tis carnificina hominum, angor animi, as well saith Aretius, the cramp and convulsion of the soul, an epitome of hell. And if there be a hell upon earth, it is to be found in a melancholy man's heart for that deep torture may be called an hell, when more is felt than one hath power to tell. Yea, that which scoffing Lucian said of the gout in jest, I may truly affirm of melancholy in earnest. O triste nomen, o diis o dibile, melancholia lacrimosa cocuti filia, tu tartari specubus opaci sedita, Erunus utero quam megra suo tulit, et abu beribus aluit, quique parvidae, amaru lentum in os lacalecto dedit. Omnes abominabilem te daemones, producerin lucem exitio mortalium, et paulo post, non Jupiter ferit tale telum fulminis, Non ulla sic procella saevit aequoris, non impetuosi tanta vis est turbinis, an aspero sustinio morsus cerberi, num virus echidnae membra mea de pascitur, aut tunica sanie tincta nessi sanguinis, illacrimabile et immedicabile malum ho. O oh, sad and odious name, a name so fell is this of melancholy, brat of hell. There, born in hellish darkness, doth it dwell, the furies brought it up. Megara's teat, Alecto gave it bitter milk to eat, and all conspired a bane to mortal men, to bring this devil out of that black den. Jupiter's thunderbolt, not storm at sea, nor whirlwind doth our hearts so much dismay. What? Am I bit by that fierce Cerberus, or stung by serpent so pestiferous, or put on shirt that's dipped in Nessus blood? My pain's past cure. Physic can do no good. No torture of body like unto it. Siculi non in venere tyranny maius tormentum. No strapados, hot irons, phalaris's bulls. Nec ira deum tantum, nec tela, nec hostis, quantum sola noces animis elapsa. Jove's wrath, nor devil's can, do so much to the soul of man. All fears, griefs, suspicions, discontents, imbonities, in suavities, are swallowed up and drowned in this Euripus, this Irish sea, this ocean of misery, as so many small brooks, tis coagulum omnium irumnarum, which Amiana supplied to his distressed paladins. I say of our melancholy man, he is the cream of human adversity, the quintessence and upshot, all other diseases whatsoever, are but flea-bitings to melancholy in extent. Tis the pith of them all, hospitium est calamitatis, quid verbis opus est, quam cunque malam rem quiris, illic reperies. 
What need more words? Tis calamity's in. Where seek for any mischief? Tis within. And the melancholy man is that true Prometheus, which is bound to Caucasus, the true Titius, whose bowels are still by a vulture devoured, as poets feign, for so doth Lilius Geraldus interpret it, of anxieties and those griping cares, and so ought it to be understood. In all other maladies we seek for help. If a leg or an arm ache through any distemperature or wound, or that we have an ordinary disease, above all things whatsoever, we desire help and health, a present recovery, if by any means possible it may be procured. We will freely part with all our other fortunes, substance, endure any misery, drink bitter potions, swallow those distasteful pills, suffer our joints to be seared, to be cut off, anything for future health, so sweet, so dear, so precious above all other things in this world is life. Tis that we chiefly desire, long life and happy days. Multos da Jupiter annus, increase of years, all men wish. But to a melancholy man, nothing so tedious, nothing so odious. That which they so carefully seek to preserve, he abhors. He alone, so intolerable are his pains, some make a question, graviores morbi corporis an animi, whether the diseases of the body or mind be more grievous. But there is no comparison, no doubt to be made of it. Multo enim saevior longe que est atrocior animi, quam corporis cruciatus. Lemnius, Book 1, Chapter 12 The diseases of the mind are far more grievous. Totum hic pro vulnere corpus. Body and soul is misaffected here, but the soul especially. So Cardan testifies, De rerum varietate, Book 8, 40. Maximus Dirius, a Platonist, and Plutarch, have made just volumes to prove it. Dies adimit agritudinem hominibus. In other diseases there is some hope likely, but these unhappy men are born to misery, past all hope of recovery, incurably sick, the longer they live, the worse they are, and death alone must ease them. Another doubt is made by some philosophers whether it be lawful for a man in such extremity of pain and grief to make away himself, and how these men that so do are to be censured. The Platonists approve of it, that it is lawful in such cases, and upon a necessity, Plotinus Liber de Beatitudine, chapter 7, and Socrates himself defends it, in Plato's Phaedon, if any man labour of an incurable disease, he may dispatch himself, if it be to his good. Epicurus and his followers, the Cynics and Stoics in general, affirm it, Epictetus and Seneca amongst the rest, quam cunque veram esse viam ad libertatem. Any way is allowable that leads to liberty. Let us give God thanks that no man is compelled to live against his will. Quid ad hominem claustra, carcer, custodia, liberum ostium habet, death is always ready and at hand. Vides illum praecipitem locum, illud flumen, dost thou see that steep place, that river, that pit, that tree, there's liberty at hand. E fugia servitutis et doloris sunt. As that Laconian lad cast himself headlong, non serviam aebat puer, to be freed of his misery. Every vein in thy body, if these be nimis operosi exitus, will set thee free. Quid tua refert finem facias an acipias? There's no necessity for a man to live in misery. Malum est necessitati vivere, sed in necessitate vivere necessitas nulla est. Ignavus qui sine causa moritur, et stultus qui cum dolore vivit. Idem epistolae octo et quinquaginta. Wherefore hath our mother the earth brought out poisons, saith Pliny, in so great a quantity, 
but that men in distress might make away themselves, which kings of old had ever in readiness, ad incerta fortunae venenum sub custode promptum, Livy writes, and executioners always at hand. Spusippes, being sick, was met by Diogenes, and carried on his slave's shoulders. He made his moan to the philosopher. But I pity thee not, quoth Diogenes, qui cum talis vivere sustines, thou mayst be free when thou wilt, meaning by death. Seneca therefore commends Cato, Dido, and Lucretia for their generous courage in so doing, and others that voluntarily die, to avoid a greater mischief, to free themselves from misery, to save their honour, or vindicate their good name, as Cleopatra did, as Sophonisba, Syphax's wife, did, Hannibal did, as Junius Brutus, as Vibius Virus, and those Campanian senators in Livy, to escape the Roman tyranny, that poisoned themselves. Themistocles drank bull's blood, rather than he would fight against his country, and Demosthenes chose rather to drink poison. Publius, Crassifilius, Censorius, and Plancus, those heroical Romans, to make away themselves, than to fall into their enemies' hands. How many myriads besides, in all ages, might I remember, qui sibi lethum in sontes peperere manu, etc., Rasis in the Maccabees is magnified for it. Samson's death approved. So did Saul and Jonas sin, and many worthy men and women, quorum memoria celebratur in ecclesia, saith Lamincus, for killing themselves to save their chastity and honour. When Rome was taken, as Augustine instances, Book 1, De Civitate Dei, Chapter 16. Jerome vindicateth the same in Yonam and Ambrose, Book 3, De Virginitate, commendeth Pelagia for so doing. Eusebius, Book 8, Chapter 15, admires a Roman matron for the same fact to save herself from the lust of Maxentius the tyrant. Adelhelmus, abbot of Malmesbury, calls them Beatas Virgines Quaesic, etc., Titus Pomponius Atticus, that wise, discreet, renowned Roman senator, Tully's dear friend, when he had been long sick, as he supposed, of an incurable disease, vitamque produceret ad algendos dolores sine spe salutis, was resolved voluntarily by famine to dispatch himself to be rid of his pain. And when, as Agrippa and the rest of his weeping friends earnestly besought him, Osculantes obsecrarent ne id quod natura cogeret, ipse accelerarent, not to offer violence to himself, with a settled resolution he desired again they would approve of his good intent, and not seek to dehalt him from it, and so constantly died, Precesque eorum taciturna sua obstinatione depressit. Even so did Corellius Rufus, another grave senator, by the relation of Plinius Secundus, Epistularum Liber Unus, Epistle 12, famish himself to death. Pedibus correptus cum incredibiles cruciatus et indignissima tormenta pateretur. Neither he nor his pilla, his wife, could divert him, but destinatus mori obstinate magis, etc. Die he would, and die he did. So did Lycurgus, Aristotle, Zeno, Chrysippus, Empedocles, with myriads, etc. In wars for a man to run rashly upon imminent danger and present death is accounted valour and magnanimity. To be the cause of his own, and many a thousand's ruin besides, to commit wilful murder in a manner of himself and others, is a glorious thing, and he shall be crowned for it. The Massegati, in former times, Barbicians, and I know not what nations besides, did stifle their old men, after seventy years, to free them from those grievances incident to that age. So did the inhabitants of the island of Coa, because their air was pure and good, and the people generally long lived. 
ante ver tebant fatum suum, prius quam manci forent, aut imbecilatis accederet, papa vere vel cicuta. With poppy or hemlock they prevented death. Sir Thomas More, in his Utopia, commends voluntary death, if he be sibi aut aliis molestus, troublesome to himself or others, especially if to live be a torment to him. Let him free himself with his own hands from this tedious life as from a prison, or suffer himself to be freed by others. And tis the same tenet which Laertius relates of Zeno of old, Juste sapiens sibi mortem consciscit, si in acerbis doloribus versetur, membrorum mutilatione aut morbis aigre curandis, and which Plato nine de legibus approves, if old age, poverty, ignominy, etc., oppress, and which Fabius expresseth in effect, Nemo nisi sua culpa diu dolet, it is an ordinary thing in China, saith Matthias Riccius the Jesuit, if they be in despair of better fortunes, or tired and tortured with misery, to bereave themselves of life, and many times, to spite their enemies the more, to hang at their door. Tacitus the historian, Plutarch the philosopher, much approve of voluntary departure, and Augustine, De Civitate Dei, Book 1, Chapter 29, defends a violent death, so that it be undertaken in a good cause. Nemo sic mortuus, qui non fuerat aliquando moriturus, quid autem interest, quo mortis genere vita ista finiatur, quando ille qui finitur, iterum mori non cogitur, etc., no man so voluntarily dies, but, wollens nollens, he must die at last, and our life is subject to innumerable casualties. Who knows when they may happen? Utrum satius est unam perpeti moriendo, an omnes timere vivendo. Rather suffer one than fear all. Death is better than a bitter life. Ecclesiastes 30.17 and a harder choice to live in fear than by once dying to be freed from all. Theombrotus and Brachiotes persuaded I know not how many hundreds of his auditors by a luculent oration he made of the miseries of this and happiness of that other life to precipitate themselves. And having read Plato's divine tract De Anima for example's sake led the way first that neat epigram of Callimachus will tell you as much. Yamque vale sole cum diceret ambrociotes in stugios fertur de siluisse lacus. Morte nihil dignum passus, sed forte platonis, divini eximium de neque legit opus. Calenus and his Indians hated of old to die a natural death, the Circumcellians and Donatists, loathing life, compelled others to make them away with many such. But these are false and pagan positions, profane stoical paradoxes, wicked examples. It boots not what heathen philosophers determine in this kind. They are impious, abominable, and upon a wrong ground. No evil is to be done that good may come of it. Reclamat Christus, reclamat Scriptura, God and all good men are against it. He that stabs another can kill his body, but he that stabs himself kills his own soul. Male meretur, qui dat mendico, quod edat, nam et illud quod dat perit, et illi producit vitam ad miseriam. He that gives a beggar an alms, as that comical poet said, doth ill, because he doth but prolong his miseries. But Lactantius, Book 6, Chapter 7, De Vero Cultu, calls it a detestable opinion, and fully confutes it. And St. Augustine, Epistle 52, Ad Macedonium, Chapter 61, Ad Dulcitium Tribunum, so doth Hierom to Marcella of Blessilla's death, non recipio tales animas, etc., he calls such men 
Matures stultae philosophiae. So doth Cyprian de duplici martirio, si qui sic moriantur, aut infirmitas, aut ambitio, aut dementia cogit eos. Tis mere madness so to do, furore est ne moriare mori. To this effect writes Aristotle three ethics, Lipsius ad Stoicam Philosophiam, Book 3, Dissertation 23, but it needs no confutation. This only let me add, that in some cases those hard censures of such as offer violence to their own persons, or in some desperate fit to others, which sometimes they do, by stabbing, slashing, etc., are to be mitigated, as in such as are mad, beside themselves for the time, or found to have been long melancholy, and that in extremity they know not what they do, deprived of reason, judgment, all, as a ship that is void of a pilot must needs impinge upon the next rock or sands and suffer shipwreck. Petrus Forestus hath a story of two melancholy brethren that made away themselves, and for so foul a fact were accordingly censured to be infamously buried, as in such cases they use, to terrify others, as it did the Milesian virgins of old. But upon farther examination of their misery and madness, the censure was revoked, and they were solemnly interred, as Saul was by David, 2 Samuel 2, 4. And Seneca well adviseth, Irascere interfectori, sed miserere interfecti. Be justly offended with him as he was a murderer, but pity him now as a dead man. Thus of their goods and bodies we can dispose, but what shall become of their souls, God alone can tell. His mercy may come inter pontem et fontem, inter gladium et jugulum, betwixt the bridge and the brook, the knife and the throat. Quod qui quam contigit, quivis potest. Who knows how he may be tempted? It is his case, it may be thine. Quae sua sors hodie est, cras fore vestra potest. We ought not to be so rash and rigorous in our censures, as some are. Charity will judge, and hope the best. God be merciful unto us all. End of section 53 End of The Anatomy of Melancholy